the, we're in the middle of the Christmas Novena, your intentions which you have asked to be prayed for. These nine Masses are being offered each day. On January the 1st, the feast of the, it's, it's the feast of the circumcision of our Lord. There will be Mass here at 6 p.m. January the 1st, tomorrow, Monday. On January the 5th, is First Friday, we have the Mass in the evening at 6.30 with All Night Adoration. And First Saturday Mass, Mass starts at 8, so Benediction will begin around a quarter till 7. And on the Feast of the Epiphany, Saturday, January the 6th, you and your family are invited to attend the annual St. Teresa Christmas dinner from 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, please come. Please uh, see the details in the bulletin. The child grew and waxed strong, full of wisdom and grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. My dear friends, many parents weep for their dead children. It is our Lord who raises them back to life through the sacraments. In the secret of today's Mass, we see and we are reminded that the sacraments save us. Christ shows himself the comforter to those who suffer. When they suffer, when you suffer, he suffers. When you joy, our Lord joys. He is so willing to share in our troubles. He was so willing then that everyone turned to him. Whether their brother was dead, or a friend diseased with leprosy, or a relative blind or lame. Let us remember that those bitter tears which blinded the widow's eyes were the greatest petition for our Lord's mercy. She, the widow, teaches us that tears are the key, are the keys to opening the heart of mercy of our God. Tears for our sins. God despises the ways of those blind in sin. God loves those who are blind with sorrow and remorse for their sins. Tomorrow's the beginning of a new year. We should at least strive to have sorrow for our sins. There are only three recorded instances in which Christ raised the dead to life. The daughter of the temple ruler Jairus, the son that we speak of today, of the widow of Nain, and one of his best friends, Lazarus. He was moved by the tears of Jairus. He was moved by the tears of the widow of Nain. And he was moved by the tears of Martha and Mary. He's always moved by tears. Even more so by the tears of the sinners. Who repent of their sins. How many millions has he raised back to life? So with tears. That you my dear friends may reap his mercy. Let that be one of our petitions. Of this year. For what scripture tells us. For what things a man sows. Those also shall he reap. The government has for a long time. Legislated on what man can. And cannot grow. This is neither good nor bad in itself. For example. It's illegal. To grow certain drugs, cocaine, and other poisonous plants. 
it's legal to raise tobacco amongst a mouth. The mouth is go governed by poundage, how much you have. It is legal to hunt certain animals during certain times of the year. In Catholic countries, during the guild system, back in the 14, 1500s, there was a certain control as so that there would be a market value for crops raised. When Catholic principles govern, there is prosperity. There is justice abounding. We as a country are careful what we sow. We're careful to balance how much food is in the country, how many cattle, how many years a certain crop can be raised on the same soil. Some of you are farmers or gardeners. You're careful for what you sow. Few of you are farmers, but all of you are farmers for what you sow spiritually and morally. And you will reap what you sow. If it is good that you sow, you will be blessed beyond compare. If it is wickedness, you will be cursed forever in hell. If a farmer had sowed corn in a certain field, and when the plant grew up, he found that it was tomatoes, he would be surprised, greatly surprised. Something of this magnitude does not happen because farmers know the difference between the grain of corn, the kernel of corn, and the tiny tomato seed. It would take a very uneducated farmer not to know the difference. Astonishingly, in the moral and spiritual realm, something very different happens quite often in the raising of children. We intend to raise virtuous children, a certain kind of children, and we often find tomatoes growing instead of corn. What has happened? In the moral realm, we reap what we sow. How is it then that we try to raise good children, but at times they appear to be a little less than what we had hoped? How is it that some are blighted with disease and some even spiritually crippled? Not only must you have good seed, good soil, but you also must cultivate. In my opinion, the disease comes from a couple of possible sources, the home or society. Some parents are not as careful as they should be to make their homes a sanctuary where the children can flee from sin. Some homes are occasions of sin. You know how, by television, cable, the phones, the computers, the satellites, the internet, the attire we let our children wear, the fighting amongst the children, lack of a prayer life. The farmer knows no matter how good the seed, the, the, the stock, If the seed does not fall upon good soil, the plant will be faulty, sickly at best. Many children are corrupt for two reasons. Because their parents were or are corrupt. I know that's not the case here. And because parents are not careful enough to take the difficult road to protect their children. The sin of the parents, even in their youth, come back to haunt them <clears throat> and their children. It's 
Scripture said, ask, can the servant be greater than the master? Hardly will any children be better than their parents. It is fruitless for parents to correct their children if they themselves have the same faults. It is their obligation to do so, even if they have the faults themselves. But without God's grace and good example, there will be very little fruit. If the children see the parents, or hear the parents use impure words, speak against God, outburst of anger, contemptuousness for everything around them, if they see dad working on Sunday, lifting the hood of the car, pulling out the mower, getting his toolbox out and hammers. If they see the parents bad mouthing their, their parents or religious, if they see the parents watching a misnomer adult shows, or abusing alcohol, what hope is it that they will not do the same? Parents at times are not careful to take the difficult road. Some parents show very little concern for the Catholic education of their children. They place their children on the bus, they're careful to make sure they have their lunch with them, and then they wash their hands. Good parents remember that he or she is the primary educator of their children, and they have to take great part in that educational process. They can't just hand it off to the schools, not even to the religious but they themselves must have an integral part in the education of their children. Some parents see that their children are on every sports team in the neighborhood, but find it hard to play with their children themselves at home. Some parents see their children attend extra religious services, but they themselves fail to say a single prayer throughout the day with their children. I know your case is different. Raising a child or children is an extremely difficult thing. And this is why God gives such wonderful graces in the Holy Sacrament of Matrimony. At the very beginning of that sacrament, husband and wife must prepare for the eventuality that God may soon bless them with children. It is to the edification of the priest that we see so many good parents. This chapel is rich with parents who spend themselves for their children. They know that we can only bear fruit when it is cut, falls to the ground, and germinates. We see our Lord reward the widow a moderately young woman, possibly in her 30s. Her only son was dead. Our Lord was moved to compassion by her tears. The whole town was moved to compassion by the circumstances. Our Lord saw in this woman his own mother, who would in less than two years from now weep for her child not because of any fault, for he was perfect, but because of the insults heaped upon him. But let's, if we're going to make New Year's resolutions, which I encourage you to do so, let's make them of a spiritual and a moral nature, that we will correct whatever is lacking in our spiritual life, that we will stay away from the occasions of sin, one of my favorite movies is A Man for All Seasons with Paul Schofield. 
who just passed away a few years ago in England. St. Thomas More gives advice to Richard Rich, a young lawyer seeking a place in Parliament, and he tells him to be a teacher. He says, a wise man goes, well, he will not be tempted. And that pertains to all of us. If we expect to make progress this year, 2024, in our spiritual life, go where you will not be tempted. It's okay. Alter your lives a little bit. Ask yourself, what is the root cause why I keep falling into sin? And do something about it. It might be simply not frequenting this person or that person, this place or that place. Fill it with something else, something good. But fill it. God love you and God bless you. And I forgot before my sermon to thank you all for your many prayers. The choir for their singing the beautiful Midnight Mass and the singing today and all the preparation they've gone through. For those who decorated the church, I thank you very much. It always looks so beautiful. Uh, I was sick before Christmas and during Christmas. I had pneumonia and Father Jenkins very selflessly offered to drive to Cleveland and to say the Mass for Christmas and then go see his family in New York thereafter. I'm very grateful to him and I'm very grateful to you and for your prayers. Um, the saddest part of my Christmas was not that I was sick, but that I wasn't able to be here with you. God love you and God bless you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.